Sitting Bull opens his eyes. Above him is the clear sky and the faces of his people looking down. He is bleeding, exhausted, in excruciating pain. The blood loss has made him pass out. For two days, he has performed the annual sun dance, looking for guidance from the Great Spirit. He has been made war chief of the Lakota. White invaders have come seeking gold in the sacred Black Hills in violation of treaties, and blue coat cavalry are on their way, sworn to kill any Lakota, refusing to live on reservations. In acts of sacrifice and endurance, Sitting Bull has fasted for days while dancing and cut a hundred pieces of flesh from his arms. But when he'd lost consciousness, that's when the vision came. Blue coats falling from the sky like grasshoppers, upside down, their hats tumbling from their heads, falling into the Lakota camp. It prophesizes a great victory, a victory that will come within days beside a river called the Little Bighorn. If you'd like to see the next episode of this Sitting Bull series immediately after watching this one a full week early, you can do that on Nebula. Learn how after the episode. Sitting Bull. His name stirs up images of the Great Plains, of Custer's last stand, of a grizzled chief in a war bonnet. And that's really no wonder, for Sitting Bull was a titan, a man who achieved legendary status within his own lifetime and became one of the most photographed men of his era. A figure who became internationally known for his victory at Little Bighorn, who rocked America to its core and defined the image of a Native American. He was also a man whose stubborn resistance to subjugation, even to his death, remains a powerful symbol to indigenous movements. A man so great that the government who killed him later put him on their postage stamp. But that future seemed a remote one. Born in what is now South Dakota, or possibly Montana, between 1831 and 1837, his father was a chief of the Hunkpapa Lakota, as were two of his uncles, meaning he had much to live up to. And he didn't start as Sitting Bull. That was originally his father's name. Instead, he was known as Jumping Badger. However, soon, his careful and considered nature, weighing options and thinking before he acted, ensured that everyone called him by the inglorious nickname of Slow. Jumping Badger wouldn't have to live with that handle for long, though, for he would have ample opportunity to prove himself as a warrior. For the Lakota prided themselves on their warrior culture with its virtues of bravery, fortitude, generosity, and wisdom, and were constantly fighting enemies. Though perhaps not the enemies you immediately imagine. Because while later he would become famous for fighting the U.S. cavalry, young Jumping Badger's early years were spent fighting the Lakota's traditional enemies, other Native Americans, particularly the Crow people. In the first two decades of Jumping Badger's life, the Lakota were in an odd transitional position. A century before his birth, they had been agriculturalists who hunted and fished to supplement their diet. But then the Cheyenne had given them something that totally changed their life. Horses brought by European colonists. Now mounted, the Lakota could take up what was known as horse culture, a way of life that involved following the enormous herds of buffalo. And the buffalo gave them most of what they needed, from meat to furs to skin for their tents cured and made weatherproof by a concoction made from the buffalo's brain. Firearms, another import from settlers, also made hunting buffalo even easier. Though, when Jumping Badger killed his first buffalo at the age of 10, he did so with a bow and arrow. But he was 14 when he gained the name he would use for the rest of his life. In an attack on a group of crow warriors, he managed to count coup, to ride up and touch an enemy in combat, then escape unharmed, shaming him. It was one of the bravest acts a Lakota warrior could accomplish. So, when they returned to camp, his father, who had also distinguished himself that day, announced that he would take the new name of Jumping Bull. To his son, he bestowed an eagle feather and his former name of Buffalo Bull Who Sits Down, a name that emphasized both pride and a dogged determination not to be moved, a name frequently shortened by outsiders to Sitting Bull. It was a fitting name. Sitting Bull would go on to win fame for his valor in war. Carrying a shield made by his father, he battled warriors from rival groups with a determination equal to his new name. Once, when challenging a crow chief to single combat, that very shield saved his life, deflecting a bullet into his foot before he killed the rival hand to hand. Soon, he was a member of both the Kit Fox Warrior Society and the Midnight Strongheart Society, two of the most prestigious warrior groups in the Lakota. And such was his fame that Lakota warriors would supposedly charge their enemies while shouting, I am Sitting Bull! as an intimidation tactic. Before long, he was named the leader of the Stronghearts. 
His reputation as a medicine man also grew, for from childhood, he'd had visions. When Sitting Bull dreamed of rain, the skies would open. His predictions came true. During the annual Sundance, he was also among the warriors who would cut themselves or even thread cords through the muscle of their chests and hang from the central pole, a feat of endurance to bring favor on his community. And increasingly, he took on more leadership roles. However, it should be noted that that meant something different in Lakota terms. For in the Lakota culture, warriors made decisions for themselves, both in war and peace. Meaning to be a leader was simply to have enough clout that others would follow you out of respect or inspiration, but not duty. If a chief decided to declare war, for instance, and a band considered it ill-advised, that group was free to leave and join another village that advocated peace. Yet unsettled times were approaching for the Lakota. For decades, they'd heard rumors about settler expansion into the southern plains, railways crossing the country, and the terrible slaughter of the buffalo. But all that, too, still seemed far away. Similarly, their nomadic lifestyle had somewhat mitigated the impact of epidemic diseases. In fact, though certainly diminished, the Lakota were among the few tribes whose population grew in the 19th century. By the 1850s, however, these problems were on their doorstep. Increasingly, settlers came from the east, and the U.S. government approached the Lakota and other Plains tribes, pushing them to sign treaties that defined territory. Some of these, like the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty, designated areas like the Sacred Black Hills to be reserved for the Lakota, but others heavily restricted tribes to pieces of reservation land, often called agencies. Paramount among the government's concerns was that the tribe also give up their nomadic way of life following the buffalo, whose herds were already starting to thin. Easily killed en masse with rifles, the settlers mostly only used the tender meat of the buffalo's tongue and left the rest to rot. Often they shot the animal for no other reason other than the pleasure of it, and sometimes even from moving trains. In fact, buffalo bones littered some plains so heavily, train passengers often mistook it for snow. These treaties promised the Lakota, Cheyenne, Crow, and other tribes that if they settled on the agencies, the government would give them food and medicine in return. And with the increasing depletion of the buffalo, a certain faction of the Lakota argued that this might be the best deal they could get, while others argued they could stay on the agency in winter when nomadic life was hardest, then slip out and follow the buffalo in the summer. Accommodation and trade would get them more than active resistance, they argued. But Sitting Bull did not trust these promises, nor any accommodation. He chose resistance. And resist he must, for the Bluecoats were coming. The Badlands, Dakota Territory, August 9th, 1864. Ambush and retreat. Ambush and retreat. Sitting Bull had not asked for this, what his enemies called the Dakota War. In truth, it had been another band of Lakota who had ambushed and killed the white settlers. Yet when 4,000 bluecoats had flooded in to exert retribution, they'd attacked his village of followers at Kildeer instead. Sitting Bull led four different tribes of Lakota, none of which had fought the soldiers before. They charged the bluecoat line on horseback, taking terrible casualties from artillery, but slowing the army's advance so the village could evacuate. Now, the Bluecoat commander was chasing them into the rugged badlands, just as Sitting Bull wanted. As the enemy marches through the broken ground, the Lakota harass them, springing ambushes with their bows and muskets. Few Bluecoat soldiers die, but by the time they finally make Fort Union, they are exhausted and drained of supplies. Declaring victory, they board riverboats and abandon the expedition. The Dakota War was over, but sadly, it was a mere prelude. For within a year, the Bluecoats would return, and Sitting Bull would be embroiled in a new conflict, when an alliance of disgruntled tribes, tired of broken treaties and federal harassment, staged the uprising known as Red Cloud's War. And you, my history-loving friend, can continue this story right now, because our second episode, entitled Sitting Bull, No Reservations, is live right now a whole week early and ad-free over on Nebula, where we talk all about Sitting Bull's refusal to sign lopsided U.S. treaties, the Dakota War beginning, and how the old man chief performed an insanely brave act on the battlefield, which would inspire many warriors to follow him to the Battle of the Little Bighorn. But that's not all. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but Nebula's kind of blowing up these days because more and more people are realizing just how many awesome shows we have on our creator-owned streaming service. That's because we have over 190 of your favorite creators and there's just always something to see. For instance, if you want to keep learning about Native American history, you could check out Knowing Better's bonus deep dive into the life of Geronimo or step back's hour-long expose on the reclamation of native lands completely ad-free. Because unlike some <clears throat> other streaming services, Nebula understands that you are paying for, you know, a 
day service, meaning there are never any ads on any videos. Plus, you get to see a ton of Nebula First series, like Extra History, a full week earlier than you can find them on YouTube, and you get access to an ever-growing list of exclusive Nebula originals you can't find anywhere else. Like Real Life Lore's Modern Conflicts episode on the Yugoslav War, the historical showdown show Archaeology Quest, where a scientist and journalist go head-to-head -head using Paleolithic survival skills, and Lindsay Ellis's Ballad of John and Yoko, which honestly is the most interesting thing I've watched this month, you have to check it out. But if you don't have access to Nebula yet, not to worry. You can sign up right now using our link in the description, or go to nebula.tv slash extra history, and you can get Nebula for only $2.50 a month when you sign up for an annual plan. Or if you want to lock in Nebula for life and never have to pay again, we are currently offering lifetime memberships for $300. So what are you waiting for? You can sign up for Nebula right here, or check out more extra history on the YouTube machine here. That one probably has ads though. The biggest bean thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Dominic Valenciana, Izzy Coin, Joseph Blame, Kuyakoy, and Michael Hoggett for being our legendary patrons.